Well, good morning, everybody. I was just looking at the um, one of the first of the Dougie's dailies that I did, and I noticed that my hair has got a lot longer since then, uh, and no chance of getting a cut anytime soon. Anyway, a man is bragging about his promotion to assistant manager to his wife. And he got so out of hand in his bragging that his wife gets really annoyed. So one day she says to him, look, being an assistant manager isn't a big deal. They even have an assistant manager of peas at the local supermarket. Not believing her for one second, the man called the supermarket and demanded, get me the assistant manager of peas. The clerk replied, would that be fresh tinned or frozen? I hope you enjoyed that one. Made you smile. Today we're going to look at the third and fourth miracles outlined in 2 Kings chapter 4 as they come as a pair. You'll remember so far that Elisha has helped a woman save her sons from slavery by doing a miracle where oil flows from the small amount she has to fill up many jars. Secondly, a woman that Elisha is friendly with uh, has a baby very unexpectedly. And then the child dies and Elisha saves him uh, and by, by bringing him back to life from the dead. Pretty dramatic stories. Today's stories involve food. And of course we all need food to survive. I think in the current lockdown actually food has become a lot more important to us. Maybe because we have more time to prepare it and eat it. In our family's case, we have five adults at the table each evening, so it's a bit of a feast. And generally, there's no meetings to rush off to afterwards, so it's kind of nice we get to time to sit around to digest the food properly and to talk to each other. The stories today are about food that was indigestible and about feeding a group of a hundred hungry fellas with a few small loaves. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So here we go with the stories. Elisha now returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land. One day, as the group of prophets were seated before him, he said to his servant, Put a large pot on the fire and make some stew for the rest of the group. One of the young men went out into the field to gather herbs and came back with a pocket of full of wild gourds. He shredded them and put them into the pot without realising they were poisonous. Some of the stew was served to the men, but after they had eaten a bite or two, they cried out, Man of God, there's poison in this stew! So they would not eat it. Elisha said, Bring me some flour. Then he threw it into the pot and said, Now it's all right. Go ahead and eat. And then it did not harm them. One day, a man from ba Baal Shashilsha, Shashilsha, what a place to live, brought the man of God a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread made from the first grain of his harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so that they can eat. What? His servant exclaimed, feed a hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated, Give it to the people so they can eat. For this is what the Lord says. Everyone will eat, and there will be even some left over. And when they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all, and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. I'm quite a fan of cookery programs. I watch The Great British Menu, Master Chef, Saturday Kitchen, uh, Nigella, all those programs. Love them. And uh, one of the things that you see in many of these programs is one of the practices that has become more popular again in recent years is foraging, where chefs go into the countryside and collect wildflowers and berries and even mushrooms to eat. Of course, with the mushrooms, you have to be pretty careful. Some are poisonous and some are hallucinogenic. So you could eat a few of those and go completely do a lally. In the first story that we've just read, one of the young prophets went out foraging for food because there was a famine. 
Now, the text doesn't say he was young, but he was obviously someone uh, who was inexperienced because he collected food that threatened to kill the whole group because it was poisonous. Apparently, scholars think it was probably a small yellow melon known as Apple of Sodom that has a stereo... Hold on, what's that word? A steroidal cardiac poison in it. That sounds like something that a spy would use to kill a rival. However, Elisha saves the day by throwing it in a bit of flour, by throwing in a bit of flour. Now, it wasn't to thicken the sauce. I used some corn flour on Sunday to thicken the roast beef gravy. In fact, I'm almost salivating thinking about it. The flour is symbolic of cleansing. Isn't it interesting that they didn't throw the stew out? Can you imagine? If you had a stew that you knew was poisonous, where would you put it? Straight in the bin. But these guys were starving. Through God's power resting in Elisha, even that which was poisonous gave nourishment. That which should have led to death kept the men alive. The second story, um, which also is about food, it reads a little bit like the story about the woman with the, the small amount of oil. Elisha accepts the gift of the small barley loaves, passes them out to, through his servant, and you know everybody thinks there's not going to be enough there to feed the men. But to everybody's surprise and delight, they are all fed. Again, it reminds us of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The band of prophets were wandering around telling people uh, to turn from Baal worship back to the one true God. It's tough work. And they get caught up in the middle of a seven-year famine that God, says, that God sends on the people because they have constantly turned away from him. Good people suffer with those who do evil. When there's a blight on the land, we all suffer, good and bad alike. However, this story teaches us that God does not forget those who are faithful to him. So while the prophets have to re re um, resort to foraging, God stops them from killing themselves inadvertently. It's not easy to necessarily equate what happened then in Israel with what happens among us now. Why God used Elisha to do miracles in the way he did, we're not really sure about. Not all the prophets got to do miracles. Elisha's real vocation was to bring the message of God's faithfulness to the people wherever he went. And God's providence at the time was just that he would be given the gift of of a miracle worker. I don't know, it may have been something to do with the level of evil that was going all on all around him and the necessity to be able to stand against false prophets and show them that God was really more powerful. But we can only guess. However, let's take something from the text to help us. Firstly, just as the prophets didn't chuck away the whole stew in their green bin. We don't necessarily need to throw away something because it's not perfect, or even something that has the potential to do us harm. God can and does sometimes use what is already in our lives to bless us and bless others by transforming it and making it holy. Sometimes the things that we used for uh, bad and unholy purposes, he can use for holy and good purposes. We cannot start again by becoming unborn, but the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we are spiritually born again means that God can take our experiences and our story and use it to make something beautiful and fruitful instead of something destructive. Secondly, God can take small amounts and do great things with them. A lot of the time we underestimate what God can do with us 
if we are fully surrendered to him. He doesn't ask us to give him what we don't have, just what we do. Let's pray. Dear Father God, please use us to bless others and to be fruitful. Please help us to see even the dark periods of our lives as something that you can use to bring healing and help to others, thus making beauty out of brokenness. Amen. See you next time.